Hello, Malcolm speaking. This is the story of the early reconnaissance Spitfires. It's a story about cameras under the wing, cameras in the wing, cameras behind the pilot looking out sideways, cameras in the fuselage looking down. However, more than any other thing, this is the story of fuel tanks, more and more fuel tanks, more and more range. Because range was the thing required for successful long-range reconnaissance missions. Our story starts in August 1939, just before the outbreak of war. We start with Sidney Cotton, an Australian-born civilian who had done some clandestine photographic reconnaissance over Germany, unnoticed by the Germans, of course. Also, Morris Shorty Longbottom, who had become very interested in Cotton's methods. In August 1939, Longbottom filed a memorandum named Photographic Reconnaissance of Enemy Territory in War with the RAF. The memorandum was inspired by Cotton, but it was Longbottom who presented it as a serving RAF officer. The document proposed using small, single-engined, high-speed aircraft for reconnaissance. These would be adapted for the role by removing any unnecessary weight, including the armament, and increasing the fuel load for maximum range. Longbottom had calculated that a reconnaissance version of the Spitfire with no armament could carry an extra load of over 920 pounds, and this would be equal to two cameras and 240 gallons of fuel. This load of fuel was two and a half times that of the fighter variant. This idea of a light, fast, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft seems fairly obvious today, but at the time, these ideas were new and they were different. Cotton and Longbottom quickly convinced Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding, officer in command of Fighter Command, of the merit of their ideas. Two machines were delivered to Heston on the 13th of October 1939, and they were quickly converted to reconnaissance Spitfires. It was now October 1939. Supermarine designers refused to have cameras or fuel tanks installed behind the pilot as they felt this would move the centre of gravity too far back. And work on various camera arrangements was carried out by the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough. The net result was what became known as the PR Type A. To reduce weight, the radio was removed, the gun ports were fared over, and all the panels were filled and everything sanded smooth and polished. The Type A featured a standard fighter type windscreen, but the canopy had teardrop bubbles added on each side so that the pilot would have improved downward and backward vision. The first modified Spitfire reached 390 miles an hour, which was 12 miles per hour faster than the standard fighter. It was painted camo tint green. This was a light blue-green color developed by Cotton himself. Two cameras were fitted. These were F24 cameras with 5-inch focal lenses. One was fitted in each wing, replacing the innermost machine guns. They were pointing almost vertically down, but canted slightly forward to cover a slightly wider area. And now, things started getting interesting. The Special Survey Flight, as the PR unit was now known, was transferred to France on the 5th of November 1939. On the 18th of November 1939, Morris Shorty Longbottom, now promoted to Flight Lieutenant, flew the first operational PR Spitfire sortie in N3071. But that is a story for another day. With the concept of the PR Spitfire now proven, the time came to develop an improved version. On the 16th of January 1940, Shorty Longbottom received the first Type B Spitfire from Farnborough. The Type B was the first to have increased fuel tankage. A 29-gallon tank was added in behind the pilot. Now, the, the weight of this tank was partially offset by removing the 40-pound ballast weight fitted to counterbalance the weight of the three-bladed variable pitch propeller. Of course, originally Spitfires had a wooden two-bladed propeller. This version was also the first to incorporate the smooth, rounded windscreen, dispensing with the armoured glass, and of course harvesting some lighter weight using this method as well. The camera installation was improved slightly, so there were still F24 cameras now with 8-inch lenses to improve the resolution. The first successful mission of a Type B was flown on the 10th of February 1940. 
By early 1940, the Special Survey Flight, as it was still known, began to standardise some aspects of its aircraft markings. Here we can see that P9331 has a 4-inch high grey serial just forward of the tailplane. On the fuselage is an A-type roundel with a yellow surround. Also in early 1940, the unit began experimenting with improved camouflage shades as they were generally flying at higher altitudes than before. A colour which they called camo tint blue-grey was developed and after a period this became standardised as PRU blue. It's quite possible that this aircraft is camouflaged in what became known as PRU blue. Development of improved types continued apace. On the 18th of March 1940, the first Type C was delivered, and on the 22nd of March, the first sortie was flown. On the 7th of April, Shorty Longbottom flew P9308 from England to photograph Kiel, quite a long journey at the time. The pictures he brought home showed what turned out to be the invasion force for Norway and Denmark. OK, let's check out the salient features of the PR Type C. The Type C was more or less the first standardised version of a PR Spitfire. We've got the deeper chin with an enlarged oil tank. We've got the smooth windscreen. We've got the canopy with the teardrops on the side. We've got the extra fuel tank in behind the pilot. And now we've got another 30 gallon fuel tank in a teardrop shape underneath the port wing. And here's a front-on view of a Type C PR Spitfire. The Type C was referred to as the long-range version due to the extra tank under the port wing containing an additional 30 gallons. However, under the starboard wing there is also a teardrop. This smaller teardrop housed the cameras. These were two F24 cameras with 8-inch focal lenses. Some later aircraft were fitted with a vertical F8 camera with a 20-inch focal length lens. This was mounted in the fuselage behind the cockpit. Two extra close-ups before we leave the Type C. Here's the lower cowling made up of multiple panels. And here's a shot of the starboard side of the canopy blister which shows the sighting arrangement fitted to this aircraft. Next up for coverage is the Type E, of which only one was made. This was N3117. The Type E had two forward-facing F24 cameras mounted under the wings. Now the photograph above of showing such a mounting is actually on a PR Mark 19, as I don't have any photographs of the single Type E. Now we move on to the Type F. This variant was a logical improvement of the Type C. It included even more fuel tankage and also it was the first variant that had all of its cameras mounted inside the fuselage behind the cockpit. The Type F was first used in July of 1940 and on the 14th of March 1941 a PR Type F flew the first operational sortie over Berlin which just goes to show how long its range had become. OK, let's run over the fuel tanks of the PR Type F. First, there's the forward upper tank. Next, there's the forward lower tank. Next, there's the tank behind the pilot. And then there are two teardrop-shaped tanks, one under each wing, with 30 gallons each in them. This gives a total fuel capacity for the PR Type F of 174 gallons, and it also has the deeper nose with the enlarged oil tank. To recap a little before I cover this aircraft's camouflage and markings, on the 1st of July 1940, the Photographic Development Unit was renamed Number 1 Photographic Reconnaissance Unit and assigned the LY unit code. This aircraft is slightly unusual in that it has an individual aircraft letter B. It's painted in overall PRU blue, and the codes are a light grey. The 4-inch serial number is also in light grey. It has the 12-inch high fin flash and a fairly standard-looking A-type roundel with a yellow outline on the fuselage. Here we have another photograph of a Spitfire PR Type F. This is X4492 of number 13 Photographic Survey Squadron, Royal Canadian Air Force. This is taken in Canada. 
we can see the two teardrop shaped fuel tanks under the wings clearly in this view. The next type we're going to cover is the PR Type G, later redesignated the PR Mark 7. In effect, this aircraft was the RAF's first fighter reconnaissance type as it retained the full A wing armament of eight machine guns and the armoured windscreen. Compared with fighter versions, the only extra fuel tank was the 29 gallons positioned immediately behind the pilot. This photograph shows Type G X4944 somewhere in England. At least until July 1941, specialised low flying fighter reconnaissance types were still painted in either green camo tint or white or very pale pink. This photograph was given to me by Roy Buchanan who flew the aircraft and he reports it as being white. The camera installation for the Type G consisted of three F24 cameras. The oblique one would have an 8 or 14 inch focal length lens. Of the two downward pointing ones, the front one would have a 5 or 8 inch lens and the one at the back an 8 or 14 inch lens. The Type G was the first version where the vertical cameras could be worked separately. Now here we have an example of a slightly later fighter reconnaissance camouflage scheme. This is a PR Type G of 1416 Army Cooperation Flight, codes DP, which operated the type during July and September of 1941. The overall dark appearance of the aircraft, with a just distinguishable disruptive pattern of upper surface colours, conforms with the prescribed scheme of extra dark sea grey and extra dark sea green upper surfaces, with PRU mauve lower surfaces. 1416 Army Cooperation Flight reformed as number 140 Squadron, and here is PR Type G R7116 with 140 Squadron. The aircraft also seems to have the low contrast, low altitude fighter reconnaissance scheme of extra dark sea grey and extra dark sea green with PRU MOVE lower surfaces. Interesting though that this aircraft has a sky fuselage band. Note also the interesting cover over the oblique camera. It seems to be modified so that the camera points more to the rear. Here is yet another interesting PR Type G. This is R7143, one of the two Type Gs sent to Canada. It has a natural metal finish and another example of a modified cover over the oblique camera bay. There must be something about the oblique camera bay that requires modification and experimentation. The last type we need to talk about in this video is the PR-13. During 1942 work was being carried out by Supermarine for a successor to the Type G. It would have been called the Type H, however as work progressed the designation system changed, so this aircraft type was only ever known as the PR-13. 26 were constructed at Heston, all converted from Mark V fighters or PR Mark 7s. The first PR-13, X-4615, first flew in September of 1942. Now the only reason why I'm including this photograph is that it is a photograph of the PR-13's Merlin Type 32 engine. I don't actually have a photograph of a PR-13 complete aircraft. The Merlin 32 was also used in the Seafire Mark III. It was a single stage supercharged engine intended for low altitude use. But the poor PR-13, it never got the full benefit of this very powerful low altitude engine. It only had a three-bladed propeller, whereas the Seafire Mark III had a four-bladed propeller to fully exploit the Merlin 32 engine. So we end on that rather sad note for the early PR Spitfires. Now you probably noticed that I haven't included any content of the PR Type D, which became known as the PR Mark IV. This is such a significant aircraft that it deserves a video in its own right. And the key feature of the Mark IV is that it had a fully integrated wet wing. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy the video 
and there's certainly plenty more on, on my channel to enjoy. Thank you, and bye for now. Please do like and subscribe, and if you're inclined to, please buy me a coffee. Every little bit helps. Thank you.